Right, we're on our way to Tadcaster, or thereabouts. Uh, it was a suggestion of one of our viewers, Teddy Wanderer. Yeah. And they suggested that we go and have a look at the site of the Battle of Tarleton, which was a battle in the War of the Roses, which yeah. ties in with our visit to Spofforth Castle um, yeah. a couple of days ago. It was actually on my birthday in 1461, the battle. Was it? Yeah. Right, okay. When I was <laughs> minus something rather. <laughs> minus about 400. <laughs> something like that, yeah. Yeah. Now, at exit number 45 for Weatherby, take the exit left. In 400 yards, take the exit left onto the A659 towards Boston Spa. Dan from Travel Trolls will like this place. <laughs> you not watched uh, any of the Travel Trolls videos, you know he's partial to a pint of John Smith's. Other beers are available. In 80 yards, turn left into your designated road A162. Okay. Now turn left. We should be turning left here. You're Do we? In the right -hand I'm lane. in the right yeah, lane and, and there's a truck behind me. Yeah. Yep. You weren't listening to the man. Oh no, I was too interested in the John Smith's brewery. brewery. <laughs> There's plenty of it in you the have car park. Road. No. Okay, right. So we just we've got to look for the battlefield now. Yeah. I'll go over on a tour around the brewery. <laughs> Here we are, Sprout Side. Okay. It's a Towton Battlefield Trail. King Henry VI was descended from John of Gaunt, the Duke of Lancaster, fourth son of Edward III, and came to the throne in 1421. Henry suffered a mental collapse after England's final defeat in the Hundred Years' War, and when he recovered in 1455, an alliance of nobles, nobles headed by his cousin Richard, Duke of York, had risen against him. Richard was descended from Lionel of Antwerp, Edward III's third son and Edmund, Edmund of Langley, Duke of York, his fifth son. This gave York a strong claim to the crown and in 1461 he forcefully pressed it, only to be killed at the Battle of Wakefield on the 30th of December. York was succeeded by his eldest son Edward, Earl of March, who was hailed as King Edward IV at Westminster Abbey on the 4th of March 1461, so now England had two kings. The Lancastrians had strong support in northern England centred on York and on March, uh, 12th of March 1461 Edward's army marched up from London to confront them. The Yorkist vanguard under Richard Neville, Earl of Warwick, reached Ferrybridge where the Great North Road crosses the River Eyre. On the 28th of March found the Lancastrians had broken the bridge. Before the Yorkists could repair it, 4 a.m. on the 29th of March, Palm Sunday, they were attacked by Lancastrian troops led by John Lord Clifford. Warwick's second in command, Lord Fitzwalter, was killed. Warwick himself was injured, and one source records that 3,000 of their men had also died. 
when Edward arrived with the main army, the Lancastrian defenders retreated. They were chased by Lord Falkenberg, Edward's uncle, whose mounted detachment crossed the air at Castleford and caught up with Clifford's force at Dintingdale near Saxton. The Lancastrians were wiped out, including Lord Clifford, who was killed by an arrow to the throat. Meanwhile, the Yorkists advanced to meet the main Lancastrian army on the fields between Towton and Saxton. By late morning, both armies were deployed in the falling snow and poor visibility. The Yorkists still missing Norfolk's contingent. Right, just making our way along the side of the road, I'm going to go to the, the board one. The trail's supposed to be 1.7 miles long. Oh, got to the first board. I said the medieval armies were arranged in three battles, Van, Rearward and Mainward. Lancastrians deployed facing south, commanded by Henry Beaufort. Warful. Beaufort, Duke of Somerset, Henry Holland, Duke of Exeter, and Henry Percy, Duke of Northumberland. A lot of Henry's, isn't there? Yeah, well, Hen isn't Henry Percy from uh, Spofforth? I think so, yeah. Yeah. Contemporary source says they had 50,000 men against 48,660 Yorkists. And the Yorkist battles were led by King Edward, Sir John Wenlock, and John Mowbray, Duke of Norfolk, who had yet to arrive from Ferrybridge. Wasn't the, uh, wasn't the Earl of um, Warwick the one that uh, did a lot of damage to the castle we saw the other day? Yeah. Most soldiers on both sides were archers and the battle began with an exchange of arrows. The Yorkist Lord Falk Falkenberg led his archers forward 40 paces, shot a volley and then retired. Our Lancastrian archers returned volley after volley, but shooting into the wind and driving snow, they could see, could not see that their arrows were falling short. Yeah, apparently it was very cold and very heavy snow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so they got a little bit there about the archery range. So they were actually out of range. So the effective range of a long English longbow is 250 metres and a sheath contains 24 arrows. Right, okay. okay. So that's what happened so far. So the battle actually started here, didn't it? Just, just there. Just there, yeah. yeah. So when Edward arrived with the main army, the Lancastrian defenders retreated. They were chased by Lord Falkenberg. across them isn't that? I can see them. What remains of a cross? Yes, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so just coming up to the second board and suddenly realise you're on quite high ground because of quite quite way down there. The second board, the uh, third board we looked at talking about all the things that they've found, haven't they? Harness bell, end of a leather strap, harness pendant, cliffhanger with the gilded head of a dog. Funny, yeah. All the places they found. A hanger? Did you say a yeah. cliffhanger? What? You a hanger, <laughs> just a hanger. <laughs> I presume a it's a coat hanger or something. So, So this would be good if you had a metal detector, wouldn't it? Yeah, well they're saying here that one of the project's metal detector is Simon, yeah, Simon Richardson, Richardson unearthed, unearthed a three centimetre diamond lead shot on the battlefield. Diameter lead shot? Yeah. Yeah. That. Yeah. And it's the earliest known composite lead shot from a European battlefield. Oh, good grief. It would have been fired from a small, small cannon, cannon or, or a large, large handgun. handgun. Started using lead rather than stone, didn't they? Yeah. Yeah. So this is sort of villages ahead of us, and this is where we are in yeah. relation to everything. Yeah. York is over there to so the right. Towton's over there somewhere. Yeah. York's over there. Yep. Dacre's Cross is over there somewhere. Yep. And London Road, which is 
Now the A1M is over there. She's right, because that's the way yeah. you came, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, that's this one's talking about no, This is about, about the battle. Yeah, looking the other way. So we're here, and the Lancastrians had advanced up to contact them. And the Duke of York arrived with reinforcements. And it says when the two armies engaged hand to hand, the Lancastrians' superior numbers pushed the Yorkists back up the hill towards Saxton. Uh, the Yorkist line may have been outflanked at its left end, so accounts report a Lancastrian ambush from Castle Hill Wood. Although this may be an excuse given by the eventual victors for their temporary setback. Well, there's a description there written in older English. This battle was sore fought and for hope of life was set on every part and taking of prisoners was proclaimed as a great offence by reason whereof every man determined either to conquer or to die in the field. This deadly battle and bloody conflict continued X hours or 10 hours presumably in doubtful victory. One part sometime flow, sometime flowing, sometime ebbing, but in conclusion King Edward so courageously comforted his men, refreshed the weary and helped the wounded that the other part was discomforted, discomforted, thus discomforted and overcome, and like men amassed fled towards Tadcaster Bridge to save themselves. He said, then in the nick of time, Norfolk's troops arrived. This seems to have turned the tide. Then, as fresh troops joined the fighting, that left the Yorkist battle line swung back. The left of the Yorkist battle line swung back. The tired and demoralised Lancastrian army broke and fled to the northwest, directly towards Cockbeck, and a terrible fate in its freezing cold, fla fast flowing water. And the Duke of, Duke of Norfolk saved it all then. So just looking over there, and just see over the over the hill the Drax power station. You've got Saxton village over there, Ferry and Ferry Bridge. Bridge. Ferry Bridge is where the M62 meets the A1. Yeah, that's right. Down there is the so-called Bloody Meadow. Okay. Hmm. How many people did you say died in this battle? It was 28,000. Wow. So some battle then. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Very, very quiet now, though. Yeah. That probably just sitting down, weren't you? Good girl. Come on, then. Yeah, and it asks you to keep to the path, keep dogs under close control and clear up after them. Livestock roam freely in this vale for your safety and their welfare. Please keep out. That means you, Pops. Some more poppies over there. Yeah, I'm just saying it's this amazing, really, when you think about it. There was a battle here over 500 years ago, 550 years ago. And Poppy's just going to rub her head. No, don't do that. <laughs> and they're still finding things, things on the battlefield. Yeah, yeah. It is Quite amazing. incredible. Yeah. All right. Another, it, board up another board coming up. And you think back on the on the World War One battlefields, so a mere hundred years ago. Yeah, I know. The stuff that they're turning up. The battles leave a huge scar, don't they? Really. Yeah. On history and on the landscape. A little bit about the weapons they were using. Yes, yeah, so the most important edged weapon on the War of the Roses battlefield was the bill. This was a development of an agricultural implement still familiar today. Many infantry on both sides would have carried them. Bills had hooked blades with spikes on the top and bottom and they could be used for cutting hooking and thrusting and their long, sh haft, long hafts made them ineffective made them effective against cavalry 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 <laughs> and infantry many of the tro many troops especially the better off men at arms carried swords and by the 15th century most european swords were designed for cutting as well as thrusting a symmetrical two-edged pointed blade was the most common form but some troops especially infantry carried single-edged cutting swords known, known as hangers. 
There's the Battle of Wakefield, 1460, that sword's from. Yeah. And that's where Edward the Fourth, or it's going to be Edward the Fourth's father, was killed. Okay. He was only 18 then, apparently, Edward the Fourth. But he wasn't Edward the Fourth then. Daggers, too, could be used for both stabbing and cutting, and may also have been used to finish off the wounded when battle was over. In close combat, piercing wounds could be inflicted by the slender points by the broadleafed shaped head of spears or were they heavy pikes of bills of poleaxes, glaives and other types of staff weapons and weapons made to inflict blunt, blunt trauma or crushing injuries were especially useful against plate armour which were designed to deflect cutting and pointed weapons off its smooth surfaces so the polax a spiked hammer welded in two hands was widely used by dismounted men at arms. The mace, often with flanged head, was also used as a sidearm by mounted men at arms. Common soldiers might carry lead maces or simple weighted clubs. The horseman's hammer was another formidable weapon, normally wielded in one hand and equipped with a striking hammer face and a stout square section beak. So that's mace and a hammer. And that's a polax. And you still have that in uh, common Common language, don't you? If people have been polaxed. Yeah. Well, if you yeah. were hit by one of those, you would definitely be polaxed. Yeah, yeah. You had projectile weapons, so the longbow from a single pe car from a single piece of yew was the most common projectile weapon uh, on the medieval battlefield, and archers formed by the great bulk of 15th century armors, armies. Longbow arrowheads ranged from simple spikes or bodkins for the battlefield to broad barbed heads often used for hunting. Many examples of an unusual arrowhead type with the cutting edges brazed to a conical socket have been recovered from the Tariton battlefield. So different types of arrows. So crossbow quarrels had larger heads usually of diamond section and there's little evidence for crossbows being used on 15th century English battlefields. Projectiles from both longbows and crossbows could penetrate armour and bone but similar injuries could be caused by the wide variety of thrusting and stabbing weapons on the battlefield. Handheld firearms have been used in European battles since at least the second quarter of the 14th century, although they were a limited tactical use. Simple tubes of wrought iron or brass cast bronze attached to wooden stocks. The wood for fired mainly lead balls cast in specially prepared moulds. Most surviving 15th century handguns have a bore diameter about 25 millimetres. Is more interested in the cows. <laughs> you want to have a look at the cows? <laughs> <laughs> and it's amazing, isn't it? The, the amount of sort of weapons that they come up on battlefields that have a, a counter to them, and uh, all these knights and all their armour and everything. Yeah, yeah. They could still be stabbed and chopped and pierced with the, with the weapons. They spend all that money on expensive armour. That's someone with a long stick to stab mm -hmm. them. Well, and they dress so attractively, really, don't they? Oh, yeah. yeah well, you, outfits. And I mean, the, 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 ar the armour that the knights wore was like the 14th century equivalent of, yeah. of tanks, wasn't it, really? Right. It cost an absolute fortune. But even on sort of the First World War battlefields, the tanks were, although they were so, hailed as such a big success, they, they bogged down in the mud and they yeah. got blown up by grenades and, yes. and uh, yeah. broke down and generally whatever weapon you come up with in war someone's going to find a way of, of destroying it. it. Now you were saying about knights on this yeah. battlefield. I think I read that 42 knights were killed. Okay, only 42. Only 42. <laughs> I don't know how many knights there were. Well, you can say that, they might have yeah. 43. Or... <laughs> Doesn't seem like much out to 28,000 <laughs> no, does it, it does, really? No, it does, no. I suppose, like, that's like I say, they were like the tanks of their day really, weren't they? Yeah. <laughs> uh, right, we're heading downhill now quite a dip here in the field right so there was a, a, a record from Edward Hall Chronicle <laughs> sounds like a newspaper doesn't it he said but in the mean way there is a little brook called cock not very broad but of great deep 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 deepness in which the what for hast of escaping and what for fear of followers a great number were drenched and drowned so 
Um, we're on the side of the field and Cox Ford, Ford is over there, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And it uh, continues, in so much that the common people there affirm that men alive pass the river on dead carcasses and that the great river of Wharf, which is the great sewer of the brook, and all of the water coming from, coming, coming from Tareton was coloured with blood. The chase continued all night and the most part of the next day. And ever the northern men, when the, they, the saw or perceived any advantage, returned again and fought with their enemies to great loss of both parties. Here it's talking about the death toll, isn't it? Yeah. It says uh, they, they thought it was 36,776. Yeah. The more commonly accepted figure is the 28,000. 28,000. But some scholars think that's exaggerated and it was close to three. Close to 3,000? <laughs> it's a bit different, isn't it? <laughs> Just a bit, yeah. 28. It's, it's saying that the, the pursuit of the Yorkists, especially those of Norfolk's battle who have arrived on horseback combined with the perils of crossing Cockbeck to cause carnage and gave the name to Bloody Meadow, the scene of much of the slaughter. Architectural investigations on the battlefield suggest that pockets of Lancastrians made a series of stands during the retreat. To the north, scattered scatters of artefacts on the high ground above Coxford suggest that the final stage of the battle took, here, took place here the last desperate effort to prevent the Yorkists from winning, marching on York and capturing King Henry, but all attempts failed and the Lancastrian cause was lost. Oh <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, it's a very Yorkshire country, isn't it, really? There is some water down there. Yeah, that's the beck, isn't it? Yes, that's the where they yeah. ran with blood. Yeah into the River Wharf. That's also, isn't it, River Yeah. Yeah. There's the other board. I saw about the armour of the uh, War of the Roses. That was a bill, man. Fall from the Royal Armoury. That's somewhere we ought to go, you know, the yes, Royal Armoury in Leeds. Yeah. And what it says is only men at arms, the wealthiest members of society, wore full suits of plate armour. It was mainly imported from Italy, Flanders, or Germany. Hardly any of it survives, but representations on monumental effigies and memorial brasses show that asymmetrical rounded armours in the Milanese style were apparently preferred. Most popular helmet worn with complete plate harness was the Salit, a German fashion produced for export to Northern Europe by Milanese, Milanese armourers. Men at arms still wore male armour in small sections to protect the gaps in plate armour like elbow joints and under arms, but male was worn more extensively by the infantry. Another common form of body armour was the Brig brigandine made from rectangular iron plates riveted inside a fabric doublet. Brigand, brigand, brigandines were more flexible than plate cuirasses but still too expensive for the lower classes of soldiers who were more like to wear a thick quilted doublet known as a jack and in the 16th century it developed into a jack of plate reinforced by small iron plates sewn inside the quilting. Jack and, and Salet. Yeah. So it says that Hazelwood Castle can be seen in the distance. By 1461, the estate had been the ownership of the Vavasor family since the Norman Conquest, and tradition its boundary was marked by the Cock Beck, although vassals of the Percy's, Sir Henry Vassasor, fought for the Yorkists at Tareton and survived, he became sheriff for Yorkshire in 1471 and died in 1499 in his 70s. Vavasor at the field of Tareton did leap over cock with missing behind him. <laughs> Is that that, you just see something grey next to that house right up on the hill. It's up there, is it? Yeah, Okay. possibly. Yeah, so we're here at the um, number nine which is uh, the Bridge of Bodies, which sounds a bit gruesome. It says the only bridge over the Beck was here. So the Beck was obviously over there. Uh, 
and it was where the old London Road crossed the stream on its way to Tadcaster. The Lancastrians who made it over the bridge probably escaped the Yorkist pursuit, but many more were probably slaughtered before they could cross the bridge of bodies where the dead Lancastrians filled the stream, allowing others to cross may have been here. They were climbing over the bodies. Yeah, so a little bit down here. Henry VI and his wife Queen Margaret and their son Prince Edward were in York during the battle. Afterwards they fled into Scotland while their surviving troops scattered across northern England and into Wales. Edward IV entered York and removed the heads of his father, Richard, and brother, Edmund, from Micklegate, where they'd been impaled after the Battle of Wakefield three months before. He replaced them with the heads of the Lancastrian lords slain at Towton, including that of T Thomas Courtney, Earl of Devonshire. Edward's early reign was occupied by subduing Lancastrian rebellions in the north. He quarrelled with Warwick the Kingmaker, then tried to replace him first with Edward Edward's brother George, Duke of Clarence, and then with Henry VI, who had been captured in 1465 and held in the Tower of London. Warwick and Clarence were defeated at Edgecourt Moor in 1469 and at Barnet in 1471, where Warwick was killed. Soon after, Queen Margaret, Prince Edward and the Duke of Somerset returned from exile in France to support Henry VI. Their army was defeated at Tewkesbury on the 4th of May 1471. Prince Edward was killed and Henry VI murdered in the tower later that month. Edward IV's reign then continued peacefully until his death in 1483. His 12-year-old son briefly succeeded as Edward V. Then he, along with his brother Richard, Duke of York, the princes in the tower, mysteriously disappeared from the Tower of London. The young king's uncle and protector, Richard, Duke of Gloucester, took the throne as Richard III, while the Lancastrian claim descended to Henry Tudor, Earl of Richmond. The Earl brought the Yorkists to battle at Bosworth in 1485, where Richard III was killed. Tudor was crowned Henry, Henry VII, and the Wars of the Roses had finally ended. So, so 1461 to 1485. Twenty-five years, yeah, of battles. Yeah. yeah. So I remember a lot of these characters from that um, series, the White Queen. Yeah. Because that was about Edward's mother, wasn't it? Yeah. And where how Edward came to the throne. And one horrible thing I remember about it was when he quarrelled with his brother George, he put him in a cauldron of boiling water and he was killed that way. Oof. It was horrible, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, finished at Barnet, didn't it? Yeah. And at Tewkesbury. Yeah. Where Prince Edward was killed and Henry VI murdered in the tower later that month. Yeah. But it, it, it took all that time before it was finally sort of yeah. ended. Well, well, yeah, the, then the Tudors took over, didn't they, yeah. from Richard III. And yeah. Richard III is, of course, Midland Castle, isn't it, where we, yeah. we went on our previous trip. That's right. Yeah, well, it's been really interesting. I hope it's been interesting, anyway. Well, I've been <laughs> We found it interesting. <laughs> Poppy's not so sure. She's Poppy's going to so walk, sure. and yeah. haven't you? You have. <laughs> I won't read all of this, but it basically sounds that in 1996 they found a mass grave of uh, battle dead during building work at the Townton Hall, which was there. There was 38 individuals, all carefully laid to use all the available space in the grave pit. And between 2002 and 2005, four more graves were discovered and archae archaeologically excavated. Three were single burials, and the fourth grave contained skeletons. They all showed evidence of having died in battle. There were other excavations across the front lawn of Townton Hall, and found, they found disarticulated human remains, suggesting more skeletons have been disturbed during previous building work, probably in the 19th century. Well, that's a little thing about the whole battle there, look. Palm Sunday, the 29th of March, 1461. So we're, that is the old London Road where we've walked on there. Oh, is it? Yeah. Oh. All right, back on the path at the side of the road, 
heading back towards the car. It's quite a long walk and I think it must be more than a 1.7 miles. Well, I don't know where I got 1.7 miles. You reckon it was... Well, my phone says it was 3.1 to just by the village sign there. Yeah. And then you've walked back to get the car and yeah. you say that was about another mile. Yeah. Yeah, I just couldn't walk any further. It just... <sighs> yeah, so I've walked, so I think, 7.8 kilometres. Yeah. On my 10,000 steps for today. Well, mine has said 8,900, so you know, you've done another thousand up to the top plus what you've done earlier. We're thinking that this was the bridge that was washed away. I don't know if we're right there. But there certainly was a bridge washed away, wasn't it, a couple yeah, of summers ago? Yeah, no, it's all these two halves. Yeah. Yeah, and two halves, wasn't it? Right, that is most definitely it for today. We've feet walked. have had enough. Feet they? have had enough. We had a nice little. Uh, it was like a pizza, wasn't it? In the. Um, well, it was a garlic bread with cheese, wasn't it? But it was in a place that seemed to do a lot of pizzas. Yeah, so it was more like a pizza. What was it called? Yeah, uh, it was called a, a, lo um, a load of garlic bread in a, on a plate. No, no, I mean the place. <laughs> oh, um, anything goes, wasn't it? Anything good goes. Anything good goes. That's right. Yeah, highly recommend it. Yeah, lots of um, German and like Belgium bit, beer, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, we had a, a, a glass of, uh, I think it was German beer. It was, it was really, German, yeah. Really nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah and a garlic bread with cheese. So it's stuffed now, aren't they? Stuffed and getting, getting hot. hot. Cool. All right, Bobby, it's just someone walking past. They're allowed to do that. So we're back to the campsite then, aren't we? Back to the campsite, so do a bit of editing. Last day Last here, day here then. and then we're off tomorrow to at Caton Village. Caton Village in Scarborough. Yeah. Yeah. So if you like what you see, give us a thumbs up. Remember to subscribe if you haven't already, of course. And uh, we'll catch up in the next one. Yeah. Okay. See you Bye then. then. Bye.